everyone. I think we can get started. Before introducing our Benning speaker, I wish to thank the Benning Society, which sponsors the lecture series. The Benning Society is an honorary society of shareholders whose primary mission is to enhance biomedical research at the University of Utah and is charged with advocating and maintaining excellence in biomedical research, mentoring future researchers, and encouraging interdisciplinary coordination in clinical and laboratory research. The Society was made possible by a very generous grant to the University of Utah Medical School from H.A. and Enda Benning. And with that, it is a great honor to introduce to you our next Benning speaker, who is a dear and respected <coughs> colleague and a consummate clinician scientist. Dr. Joan Miller is the Henry Willard Williams Professor of Ophthalmology and Chair of Ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Miller also serves as Chief of Ophthalmology at Massachusetts Eye and Ear and Massachusetts General Hospital. Joan graduated with high honors from MIT, undergrad, and Harvard Medical School. She is most known for her work in age-related macular degeneration, one of the leading causes of adult blindness worldwide. And we all likely know someone who's been afflicted with this condition. Joan and colleagues developed photodynamic therapy using vertiporfin, the first pharmacologic therapy for age-related macular degeneration, and identified the importance of vascular endothelial growth factor in <coughs> ocular diseases. And this has formed the basis for our current anti-angiogenic therapies for many ocular diseases. As a well-respected clinician scientist, Dr. Miller serves as consultant for a number of scientific advisory boards and maintains a practice as an exquisite vitreoretinal clinician. She leads not only in her position as chair of ophthalmology at Harvard, but also nationally and internationally, and has paved the road for burgeoning clinician scientists and surgeons as a strong mentor and supporter listing over 80 direct mentees, many of whom now hold academic positions around the world. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and a recipient of numerous awards, including, along with colleagues, the 2014 Antonio Champalamar Vision Award, which is the highest <coughs> distinction in ophthalmology and visual science. She will speak to us today regarding ongoing research to improve outcomes in patients with age-related macular degeneration. Joan. Thanks, Emmy, for that very warm introduction. It's really wonderful to be here. I, I'm embarrassed to say I've never really spent any time in Salt Lake. I've just landed in Gun Ellsworth, so it's really been a treat, and even more of a treat to be here at, at Moran and, and seeing all the wonderful things that, that you're doing here. Uh, and it's an honor, of course, to give the, the Benning Lecture. First, just want to provide um, my financial disclosures. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is not really relevant because it's mostly today is all about speculation. And um, these are really related to uh, the work I did in uh, Board of Corporate PDT as well as some consulting. Uh, I wanted to look up and learn a little more about the Benning Society and the Benning Gift uh, before coming to give the lecture. So I, I, I did that and was intrigued of, to learn about the Benning family and the Amalgamated Sugar Company, and then really seeing the connection uh, between Grateful Patient and this wonderful endowment that was given to the institution. And, you know, as a chair, we, we all aspire to uh, uh, leveraging these relationships and uh, reminding uh, clinicians and any kind of, uh, anybody involved in, in the patient care aspect how important uh, your interactions can be in terms of uh, uh, stimulating this great generosity and making uh, possible the supports that really let us do the research and training that we, that we uh, view as our mission. So just uh, kudos to the Bannings. So age-related macular degeneration remains a, an important public health problem. It is the third leading cause of blindness worldwide after cataract and glaucoma and the leading cause of blindness in industrialized countries. As clinicians, we still really categorize it based on what we see looking in the retina. Uh, with the typical drusner deposits that you can see in that upper middle panel, some pigmentary deposits, all in the sort of earlier intermediate forms. And then the late stages characterized either by atrophy that you see on the bottom left or the neonic vascular form in the lower two panels. 
uh, both of which lead to severe vision loss. <clears throat> We've had advances in treatment primarily directed at the advanced forms and really uh, reserved for the late form, uh, the neovascular forms of advanced AMD. And when uh, I finished my training, really all we had was laser photocoagulation there where you used a hot laser to try to coagulate the blood vessels, but of course damaged the retina overlying those. It was really not a very rewarding treatment. We moved through photodynamic therapy, had some brief uh, forays into surgical removal or translocation. People tried injecting steroids. Then really it was anti-VEGF therapy that has changed uh, so much of what we do uh, for patients with this condition. And I like to joke that uh, retina clinicians have this particular graphic imprinted on a, in their brain. It's sort of like the Halle Berry cell. This is the uh, retinavizumab phase three data cell. Uh, because this was such a, a change from what we've been able to do for patients. So this is the vision outcomes from the uh, MARINA study, which was the Ranibizumab or Lucentis trial in, in wet macular degeneration, where, showed, where we saw for the first time really vision improvement over the course of two years compared to what our standard of care was. So with anti-VEGF therapy, more than 90% of patients can avoid moderate vision loss. A third achieve uh, vision of 2040 or better, which is driving vision. And there have been a number of studies that have really compared the various ages that we have now, really showing very similar outcomes for macular degeneration. But what happens sort of beyond two years? And, you know, really the prospective randomized clinical trials that we like to rely on really go out to 24 months, and that's about it. And given uh, the cost of them, I don't think we will get more than that. There have been some extension studies where people have used the patient populations that are willing to come back and be sort of studied uh, longer afterwards uh, that we've sort of looked at. One of those is the 7-Up study. A number of us have done some retrospective studies from random practice groups. And these are all, of course, flawed because there's you know, different protocols, you know, a varied uh, degree of follow-up and, and varied drug. And I think there's a move uh, to use registries, things like the American Academy of Ophthalmology's IRIS registry, where we'll have uh, more realistic outcomes uh, studies that'll at least give us some indication of how things really work sort of in the real world. But when you look at the studies that we have, and you start looking out longer than the two years, you find that by the time you get out to four, seven, or 10 years, that most of these patients end up losing vision. So they don't maintain great vision. Uh, and what they seem to do is to progress to atrophy. Um, and that's sort of the standard that you see throughout the, with either autofluorescent studies or imaging that you can see uh, macular atrophy in a very large percentage of these patients. So what happens when you've controlled the neovascular process and why are these patients losing vision? Well, I would argue, and I think that the most, uh, the greatest underlying cause is really that you're unveiling what is, after all, a degenerative disease. And so that you really have controlled angiogenesis and permeability, but you are uh, continuing to have a degenerative problem and, and patients end up with geographic atrophy. Of course, it's also possible that we end up with poor perfusion there in part perhaps because of our anti-VEGF treatment. And so you get progression of atrophy because you've wiped out the blood supply. And then of course there is a role potentially for anti-VEGF since uh, VEGF is a neurotrophic agent. Well, if you look at some of the older studies, these are images from Anne Milam, where she looked at what happened over line drusen, and you can see that there is a degenerative process that occurs in the rods and cones, and obviously a more extensive loss by the time you get to geographic atrophy. But if you look even back in some of Green's old studies, you can see that same kind of process happening over neovascular lesions. So you get abnormalities of the photoreceptors and eventually uh, loss of those cells. And in fact, even in the more recent studies, the CAT trial, Grinwald showed that uh, geographic atrophy progression rates were really, really similar to treated neovascular AMD patients as they were to those with non-neovascular AMD. Then, I, as I mentioned, it can also be that we are destroying the perfusion of the outer retina. Um, I think that as CNV, coronal neovascularization, develops, that it replaces the normal chorocapillaris. And then if that, if that lesion regresses, that you're really left without a way to perfuse the outer retina. And strategies to really uh, cause regression of the chronic vascularization may be detrimental. And finally, blocking the neurotrophic uh, effect of uh, VEGF uh, has the potential. I don't know that there's great clinical evidence for that. 
probably were not completely effective at blocking VEGF, and probably that's a good thing for the retina. So all of this sort of leads me to advocate for a role for neuroprotection. I think that uh, intervening uh, with neuroprotection in this degenerative process can prevent uh, vision loss and the atrophic changes that you see. So we would suggest combining neuroprotection adjuvant therapy along with anti-VEGF to prevent this photoreceptor cell death and improve vision outcomes both in the short term and long term. So far we've yet to convince a pharmaceutical company to go along with us on this. So we've been studying this for a while. A lot of this work is really led now by Demetrius Vavas at our location. And we first started actually with David Zacks, who's now in Michigan, looking at apoptosis in the death of photoreceptors. And that seemed to occur in the models that we used. We started off actually using a model of retinal detachment in the rat and then in the mouse. Uh, you could see caspases in, that were involved. Uh, but when you block the caspase inhibitors, you really didn't prevent photoreceptor cell death. And so it turned out that we found that there was another cell death pathway that was involved, which was programmed necrosis uh, through the RIP kinases. But that if you were able to block both uh, the apoptosis pathway and the necroptosis pathway with two different agents, you could actually really prevent photoreceptor cell death. And we've done that in a series of models, the retinal detachment certainly, and then sort of a few AMD-ish models, including chemical injury models with sodium iodate and double-stranded RNA, and then one retinal degeneration uh, model in the RD10 mouse. So we would argue that there are multiple cell death pathways that are somewhat redundant and complementary, and that this combination therapy is really uh, what one needs to, to go forward with to adequately protect the photoreceptors. And uh, this just sort of goes through a few more of these pathways. What we found in terms of cell death uh, in, the, in the models that we've been using really seem to be apoptosis and necrosis. Pyroptosis we'll get into a little bit more in terms of inflammasome activation in AMD, and then autophagy obviously is important in sort of normal uh, cell function as well. So I would argue that neuroprotection may offer some broad-based treatment approaches to a variety of, of disorders, including macular degeneration. We think it would be useful as an adjuvant therapy along with anti-VEGF and the neovascular forms, but ultimately you'd want to treat you know, early and intermediate AMD but what, of course you'd need some long-term safe delivery strategies for that. So what about treating macular degeneration earlier in the process? Uh, one of my mentors chastised me uh, for focusing so much on the avascular AMD in my, in my career because he said, you, you don't want to be starting on the end stage of the disease, that's stupid. You should be really working upstream. Uh, and of course, you know, now that is the focus. Uh, <coughs> For many of us, um, I would argue that you know the severe vision loss at the time was really the neovascular form, so it seems kind of logical to me. Uh, but now we and others are really trying to understand how we can treat earlier on in the disease process. And it's worth remembering that the successful treatment that we developed for neovascular AMD was really based on a therapy that was targeted to a key pathway. It turned out that VEGF really was and had a key role in angiogenesis and permeability and macular degeneration and, and many other uh, ocular neovascular diseases. But if we're going to target early AMD, we need to really understand AMD pathogenesis better and to, to develop those targets. So in trying to understand AMD pathogenesis, one needs to put together a whole, you know, information from a whole series of investigations. So including clinical observation, which we sometimes forget about these days, Imaging, which is near and dear to the clinician's heart now. Epidemiology, histopathology, and then more recently from genetics and molecular biology. And when you pull those together, you know, I've tried to categorize it. I think you end up with these six sort of different buckets or pathways, as it were. Age and senescence, lipid and lipoprotein metabolism and transport, inflammation and immunity, extracellular matrix and cell adhesion, angiogenesis, and then cellular stress and toxicity. So in thinking about how the process occurs, you know, this is really just your outer retina, chorea capillaris down below, Brooks membrane with the sandwich of, of uh, elastin between two layers of collagen, and then RPE above that. Uh, with age, uh, you get um, lipofusion in the RPE, a lipid wall that occurs, uh, that develops, 
and then the uh, basolinear laminar deposits, and ultimately a druse. Uh, with those lipoprotein deposits, you get inflammatory activity that can be complement mediated, can also involve the inflammasome, which I haven't added to my cartoon yet. And then uh, it can go in different directions. You can get uh, breakthrough uh, brooks and angiogenesis and permeability with neovascular AMD, or you can end up with uh, uh, cell death, uh, both the RPE and photoreceptors, and geographic atrophy. So what about targeting some of these? So first thinking about age and senescence, and this is uh, kind of still in a rudimentary stage, but one aspect is alterations in autophagy and drusenoid deposit uh, formation. And there also appears to be alterations in energy sensor function, which can lead to some synaptic dysfunction. So thinking about autophagy, this is a major catabolic system which is used to degrade unnecessary or dysfunctional cellular components using the lysosome. And of course, the RPE does this every morning when we wake up when it uh, engulfs photoreceptor outer segments. Uh, and an important uh, protein involved in this is the lysosome-associated membrane protein 2, or LAMP2, and it's, it's key in autophagy. And we found that, and others have shown, that LAMP2 is expressed in the RPE, it decreases with age, and it decreases in AMD. And this is uh, work again by Bavis, uh, looking at a LAMP2 knockout mouse, and it's interesting that it, it seems to recapitulate some of the aspects that we think of in AMD, and that it has these deposits uh, that accumulate uh, between six and 12 months. Of course, mouse does not, as you know, have a macula, so you're just looking sort of at peripheral retina. And when you look with autofluorescence, you can see that these autofluoresce. <coughs> In these same mice, over time, you get uh, thickening of Brooks membrane and drusenoid deposits that occur that are uh, seen at six months and then more impressive at 12 months. So it has some similar aspects uh, to what we see in patients with macular degeneration. So there may be this age, both an age-related and perhaps disease-specific dysregulation of autophagy in the RP that may be part of the you know, pathogenesis of AMD. And it seems that impaired LAMP2 function is involved in the accumulation of this drusenoid material, and that these LAMP2 deficient mice recapitulate many of the features of AMD. So again, maybe not necessarily LAMP2 itself, but targeting autophagy dysregulation may be a strategy for early AMD. So another uh, sort of target in, in aging and senescence is that uh, there seems to be a role for uh, controlling senescence through AMP kinase. And I've forgotten most of AMP kinase in, in my brain. I'm sure more of you remember that well. But just as a refresher, you know, when uh, when consumed AMP is produced, uh, AMP kinase is activated, and AMP kinase really functions as an energy sensor within the cell and a positive uh, regulator of autophagy. And you can regulate it by a number of uh, inputs: exercise, caloric restriction, never a popular one for any of us. Um, LK, LKB1, ACAR, uh, which is an exercise memetic, and of course metformin, which is kind of a target of interest to people these days. So this just shows some of the uh, upstream and downstream uh, aspects to AMP kinase. And what Josh Sains and Demetrius Vavis looked at were uh, the role of AMP kinase in aging effects within the retina. And they found that there were uh, age-related changes in both neural and retinal function, resulting in part from changes, alterations in synapses. And you can see that in the retina of young adults, the synapse is really localized to a narrow uh, band, the outer plexiform layer. And of course, this is a neurology, you know, neuroscience view of the retina, which I have trouble with. Uh, but really, they're all limited within this range. And with aging, you start getting these aberrant uh, outgrowths. And it seems that so these processes are regulated by AMP kinase. And when you, you can cause <coughs> similar changes in young animals if you have a conditional knockout of AMP kinase and you start to get uh, this abnormal formation. And if you can stitulate activate AMP kinase, you can attenuate the synaptic aging changes, as you can see uh, down here. And you can activate AMP kinase either through gene delivery uh, or caloric restriction which is what we've got in the middle, or with high-dose metformin. And all of those can uh, restore this aging decline that you otherwise see. 
So again, it may be this, the AMP kinase pathway could be another attractive target for interventions aimed at sort of mitigating this age-related uh, synaptic decline. So the next uh, pathway is lipid and lipoprotein metabolism and transport. And it's been long demonstrated by many, including Curcio and others, that there are a lot of similarities between AMD and atherosclerosis. And if you think of Brooks membrane being similar to the vascular endothelium, and lipoproteins like apolipoprotein B deliver cholesterol to the tissues and become retained in Brooks membrane and in the sub-RPE space. This retained lipid leads to the lipid wall and then to the basolineal deposits in drusen. And the RPE plays a really key role in this process in that it uh, both uh, takes up lipoproteins from the circulation, it accumulates lipoproteins in the process of phagocytizing the photoreceptor outer segments, and the RPE actually has significant uh, lipoprotein <coughs> synthesis. So again, just sort of refreshing on our lipid wall accumulation and basal linear deposits. Uh, one can think about targeting different aspects, so whether it's lipid transport or the RPE lipid metabolism itself, or sort of going after the retained lipoproteins once they have occurred. There are, of course, uh, various uh, associated with AMD that are, have, are genes in the lipid transport and metabolism pathways, uh, which I've listed here. So there's sort of, a, you know, obviously a genetic component suggesting that this pathway is important as well. Well, one way to think about targeting lipids is to think about statins. And this is something that uh, people have looked at really over the last couple of decades. And it was sort of an easy thing to think of because of the lipid lowering and also anti-inflammatory effects of statins. And the previous investigations really have been very mixed in terms of whether it can either affect uh, the, the development of AMD or alter its progression in any way. And in fact, in 200, 2015, there was a Cochrane review that, that just concluded that SADS really played no role in preventing or delaying the onset of AMD or its progression. But, you know, ophthalmologists have not quite given up. So Geimer uh, in Australia performed a prospective randomized placebo-controlled study which suggested that simvastatin meant slow progression of non-advanced AMD, especially in those with the CFH risk allele. And Vanderbeek, uh, who's now at Penn, showed that an increased serum LDL and triglycerides in more than a year of statin use led to an increased risk of neovascular AMD, and made the argument that it wasn't that statins increased your risk of progression, but that these folks were very resistant uh, to statins. And the Eleanor study showed uh, serum HDL perhaps increased AMD risk. And then again, the Kleins with the Beaver Dam study, and using a meta analysis of three cohorts, once again said, you know, no association on either incidence or progression. So why all this variability? Well, one aspect may be that there's a real heterogeneity uh, within in AMD, particularly what we characterize as intermediate AMD. So all of these images would classify as that from you know, a few uh, drusen in the macula to some not very much in the way of drusen, but pigmentary changes, and even this very sort of large drusen deposit. And it's possible that these really are not all one category. Then it's also a lot of variable dosing and activity of the statins. Uh, 40 milligrams of simvastatin is equivalent to 20 milligrams of atorvastatin, so you need to sort of know how to convert those. And of course, there's a very wide use of statins in the population. So Bob, is, once again, is kind of the Energizer Bunny in our AMD group, was reading cardiovascular literature and you know read pretty old uh, papers by the cardiologists where they used actually high dose of torostatin to prevent restenosis, and a number of studies uh, confirmed this, and they actually could even get regression of plaque with these high dose uh, statins. So you can see here that's a carotid artery, so a lot bigger vessel than we're used to looking at, with a plaque. Uh, and with uh, high dose atorvastatin or Lipitor over the course of three years really showed uh, resorption of that plaque in a near normal vessel. So Bob was like, well, you now that's a carotid. You know, maybe I could do the same thing in the outer retina. And maybe you could just sort of take that patient and make all this stuff dissolve and, and put them back 20 years and give them you know, 20 years of freedom from uh, the risk of vision change from AMD. So he had you know, gave that some thought, didn't really act on it. Had a 63-year-old patient come in who was a photographer, 
very unhappy with his vision, although the vision measured quite good. It's 2025 with some distortion. He had large you know, confluent drusen and some overlying disturbance in that area, but Bob is sort of true to uh, the recommendations, just told the patient to go home and take his air as supplements. So a year later, the patient came back, more unhappy, visual acuity is 2030, still good by retina standards. And at that point, the patient was, you know, really wanting to try something, and Bavis described sort of his rationale and thinking why the atorvastatin might be useful. And, uh, you know, described that the patient, had the, wanted the patient to work with his internist in order to go forward with this. The internist called up Bavis saying, you know, what are you crazy? You know, what are you using hydrostatins for the eye? You're out of your mind. Uh, but after some conversations, they kind of came to an agreement and started the patient initially on 10 milligrams and escalated up to 80. And within six months, the patient was really happy. Vision was 20-20, and there was improvement on the fundus photographs. So here he is at baseline, showing these large drusen and uh, more pronounced on, on OCT. And so uh, just color fundus photos, you know, again, baseline, and then one year after treatment. You notice that many of the drusen disappeared, not all of them, sort of regular flavored drusen are not disappearing, but these large, sort of fat, juicy ones are. And sort of more pronounced on the OCT uh, that these deposits really resolved. And what's more intriguing is there really didn't seem to be atrophic changes. So we sometimes see, I mean, those drusenoid deposits do go away, you're usually left with geographic atrophy. So this was intriguing, and based on this, uh, we went forward with a, a smallish pilot study uh, with Demetrius Bavis and a colleague in, in Crete, Maltiatus Solombaris, enrolling patients who are over 50 years of age with those large soft confluent drusen, so not everybody with intermediate AMD, really avoiding those with geographic atrophy and avoiding those with anemia vascular AMD. And we had 26 subjects enrolled and three discontinued, one because of some cramps, uh, one from some muscle aches, um, it's worth noting, which I didn't know before we did the study, that the, the really severe muscle uh, cramps that you know about with statins are not dose-dependent, they're idiosyncratic. So patients either get them or they don't, and it's, it's not a question of, of the dose in that case. You do need to be careful of their uh, liver enzymes, and those have to be monitored when you're on this high of a dose. One patient stopped a week after starting the drug because uh, they thought that that there was hair loss related to that. I, I don't think that was the case. In any case, we had 23 subjects who completed follow-up with a minimum of 12 months, and 10 out of the 23 showed regression of the Drusen posits, eight nearly complete. We had no atrophy and no progression to neovascular AMD. And those who responded anatomically all showed you know, a very minor visual acuity gain, and the average time to response was about a year. So we looked at those who responded, meaning that their drusenoid deposits got better, and those who didn't, to sort of see if we could tell any difference between them. And in particular, looked at how effective we were at, at lowering cholesterol. And you can see actually that the non-responders had a you know, greater decrease than those who responded. And really, otherwise, there was uh, not much in the way of difference between the two. So previously, as I said, you know, we can get the drusenoid deposits will go away, but usually you end up with atrophy and vision loss. And in this pilot study, we were intrigued because we got regression of the drusenoid deposits with you know, vision gain or at least stable vision and without atrophy. And we had no cases progressing to neovascular uh, AMD, although you would have expected a few of those to occur. So you, know, you might wonder, well, you know, how is this working? What do we think it's actually doing? Um, it doesn't seem to be based on lowering serum cholesterol, as I just showed you. It may be that we're altering the RPE lipoprotein metabolism. We may be creating enough of a local gradient that you can have efflux of the lipids from the outer retina. You may actually be just affecting lipid efflux from the macrophages, which we know are sort of in the outer retina uh, as part of this process. And then, of course, on top, the statins have all these other goody effects, including anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective and anti-angiogenic. They, they are kind of a wonder drug. But, but that's not related to what we're seeing in terms of the uh, Jerusalem deposits. So based on that, we're planning a larger uh, phase three controlled multicenter study. We would like to include some genetic analysis and look also more carefully at the lipid uh, subspecies. We did not include dark adaptation uh, in this early trial, though we would now. I mean, the, the photographer was sort of his own dark adaptation tester because that's part of his job, and, and that was actually what he noticed changing first. 
And then, of course, imaging and other functional studies. So moving on to the next pathway, Im inflammation and immunity is another um, sort of opportunity. And inflammation, in terms of a sort of low-grade smoldering inflammation, seems to be involved virtually in all the stages of AMD. And in the early stages, it may actually be that there's an impaired inflammatory response and that the inflammasome, uh, which is important perhaps in removing these lipids by being sort of underactive, allows them to <coughs> accumulate. And then once the lipoproteins are present, you seem to get a chronic inflammatory response to them. And this inflammatory response is targeted to the RPE, the cryocapillaris, and to Brooks. So, there are different uh, targets within this, all of these inflammatory pathways that include complement regulation, in which there's been a lot of study. Uh, the inflammasome uh, also is sort of a relatively new one that people are looking at. But there's also actual inflammatory cells that seem to be involved and can either be circulating or resident uh, in, within the retina. And all of these may be possible uh, targets to go after. Of course, uh, the genes uh, gene associations in AMD were strongest, of course, with complement, and there are others involved in these inflammatory and immune uh, pathways. So there are uh, clinical trials ongoing. So far, none of the, the complement inhibitors have worked. Uh, there is one uh, still ongoing that we're waiting to learn about, which is the CFD trial uh, from Genentech. Part of the trick with these complement trials is that people are really trying to prevent progression to geographic atrophy. And that's really sort of a late-ish stage of intermediate AMD, as it were, and that you're, you're now sort of on this uh, trend, on this, you know, the train is rolling down the tracks, and you're trying to prevent cell death. It's, it's not that you're trying to influence something very early in the disease. There are uh, this interest in the inflammasome. There's actually sort of two camps. Uh, Sarah Doyle and her group in Ireland think that the inflammasome is underactive and are developing agents to increase its activity. Uh, Jam body and others have the anti-inflammasome camp and are developing inhibitors uh, that, that all of these actually will end up in clinical trial. And we will probably get the answer uh, in the clinic. So the angiogenesis uh, we sort of talked about, I think we've done reasonably well with that. I think the cellular stress and toxicity, uh, we could do more with neuroprotection. Uh, so lots of good success with this. Uh, people had tried to improve quite recently on anti-angiogenics by incorporating an anti-PTGF with anti-VEGF, which just failed. Uh, I mean, I was sort of chatting about that. We really were not big fans of that approach, but uh, that one has failed, uh, and people are still thinking about other combinations. But I think clearly uh, trying to figure out how to prevent RPE and photoreceptor cell death is a, is a good target. But in terms of thinking about the treatments to go after uh, for early and intermediate AMD, I really do think that these pathways of agents, in essence, lipid transport and metabolism, and inflammation are really the sort of the, cre the three uh, large categories that hold the most promise. One of the problems with in sort of the last piece that I'll go through uh, this afternoon is thinking about you know, developing treatments for early and intermediate AMD. We have several difficulties. One is that visual acuity is not a good outcome measure because vision does not change enough uh, in these early stages. So we need to figure out other outcomes measure, outcome measures. And then as I've sort of alluded to, I think particularly the intermediate AMD classification is a very heterogeneous group and may actually be uh, more than one uh, category of disease. So I think the clinicians really need to get going and working to improve our phenotyping and classification within uh, this, this group. And using you know strategies that we have, including different forms of OCT, autofluorescence, dark adaptation, uh, and we're actually investigating others are um, topolomics that one could then combine with genotyping. So we have a collaboration arising out of what's the Harvard Portugal Portugal program, and we're sort of looking at both these aspects, trying to improve the AMD phenotype and also developing biomarkers, and the groups. On the Portugal side uh, is the Coimbra University of Medicine, AB Lee, and then also the Ibero uh, University. And on sort of on the other side of the Atlantic, we have our Harvard Department of Ophthalmology, also working with the Harvard School of Public Health and the Broad Institute. <coughs> so we're looking at uh, looking at AMD structure function correlation, and then actually doing the tobolomics on plasma and urine to try and develop a biomarker. 
So in terms of the structure of function, we're trying to look at other measures of retinal function. So dark adaptation uh, using the adaptics, DX, distortion reading speed, microperimetry, and then trying to correlate that with uh, imaging, mostly with uh, various forms of OCT. So we've just sort of started to collect and, and publish some of this. Uh, this is just sort of from one of our uh, projects looking at, again, uh, OCT findings compared to actual changes in the dark adaptation in the patient. Biomarkers, I think, are of interest in a number of diseases, including AMD, and the goal is to identify a biomarker other than looking at the fundus uh, that identifies subjects with AMD and can correlate with disease progression. So people have tried previously to look at serum biomarkers, and it's been somewhat inconsistent. Some of the approaches have included looking at C-reactive protein, homocysteine, and lipids. And people have been looking at proteomics and starting to look at metabolomics. So proteomics, of course, is downstream of translation and transcription. It does reflect sort of both the micro and macro environmental conditions. Metabolomics is a, another step further. It's, it's looking at uh, the metabolites all less than a kilodalton. And so, of course, it's downstream of translation, transcription, but also metabolism. And it, it picks up uh, characteristics related to the environment, to the diet, and to the gut microflora as well. So this just sort of shows you sort of how downstream you are. So you're hoping that you're caching information that's related to the genome, transcriptome, and proteome, as well as these other aspects. And then the idea is that by correlating that with phenotype, you, you may develop your biomarker. So we, uh, or as I said, just really getting started on this. Uh, people have used metabolomics in, to try and profile other diseases, including cancer, and our goal is to develop this biomarker for AMD. There's different mechanisms or different ways to test for metabolo metabolites. Uh, NMR uh, is something that's sort of good as a screening tool. Mass spectrometry is, is sort of more labor intensive. Uh, and something when you're sort of trying to hone down on a particular pathways. And what we've been looking at is doing this metabolomics in both AMD subjects and controls. And some of our early findings just suggest that there, perhaps not surprisingly, there seems to be an altered fatty acid metabolism in all the stages of AMD, and some evidence of increased cell membrane metabolism, and then lower levels of antioxidants. And so I think it's these kinds of approaches, again, particularly in the early and intermediate stages, to get better at our structure, structure function correlation, and then perhaps to use metabolomics and genomics to develop a biomarker. Ultimately, we want to come up with better treatments, and I think, as uh, so you're sort of thinking about targeting within these specific pathways, is how we will get there. And as I've alluded, I think, you know, for the early and intermediate, it's really the agents in essence, the lipids, and inflammation. And just want to uh, acknowledge my collaborators, in particular Demetrius Vavis, who sort of mentioned quite a bit, but our sort of AMD uh, group, the biomarker study really led by Diva Hussain. Uh, neuroprotection, again, Vavis really driving a lot of that. And our collaborators for the high dose atorvastatin and our funders. So thank you very much. factors dysregulated just with his arms too and uh, what, what is your thought about how it responds to the things you're talking about and, and could it be something that would be quite dramatically different in other words we're lumping two totally different diseases inside of one basket right I think that that's quite likely that we are sort of lumping if not two you know maybe multiple diseases in the basket and maybe you know there may be different ways to get to sort of things that look similar to us as clinicians and that certainly once you get to a certain point, you know, falling off into either geographic atrophy or, or the ambassador AMD, you know, you can sort of get there from, from different categories. So I think, again, it's sort of trying to understand the phenotyping, uh, I think is going to be key. And I think that's been an issue even with sort of the wonderful genetic work that's been done. I mean, you know, again, the clinicians sort of were using the tools that we had available. 
you know, and the tools keep, keep getting better. So it's like trying to understand how we can learn more about the disease, uh, you know, with better tools and, and really come up with better categories. It's sort of not sexy, you know, sort of splitting and categorizing diseases is not something that we think is really sexy science at this point, but I think it's going to be key for really moving forward. In Just a, one interesting tidbit on that is that is we're trying to look at some pure chromosome 10. So homozygous 10, no, uh, no risk, yeah. HRA1, no, no risk anywhere else, is that uh, we're seeing a fair number of these people who are going right to geographic atrophy or right to neovascular without Drusen or heart right. change at all. So they would be called normals and then suddenly they have bad disease. Right. So that, that's, that's something that's, that's got to scratch in our heads. Yeah, it is intriguing. And that you get, this, you get this sort of similar questions, but different when you talk in Asia, because in Asia people say, well, people just erupt with polyploidal, so right. they're just erupting with neovascular, and they certainly don't have bruise. And I guess the question is, if you did an SDOCT on those folks, I mean, do you think they have you know, some thickening or abnormality of the Brooks? I, I suspect that there's something there. I mean, the Drusen are just the excrescences that right. we see. It's really not even the underlying abnormality that's there. But I, again, I, I think there's room to think that there's sort of different categories in here that we've lumped. Right. You know, similar problem, remember what I was talking about today, with the glaucoma, or sure. the sort of open angle glaucoma, you know, it's probably more than one disease. So, Joan, can you talk a little bit about the challenges you may have going forward on a statin trial, where it's a relatively inexpensive drug? Can you really get the drug companies interested in this and get it funded? Right. So we're uh, so yeah, Libitor Torvastatin is off patent, so it's about eleven dollars a day or eleven dollars a month. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, in the U.S., still expensive. In India, when I presented this in India, they were they were not happy with it. Uh, so yeah, we're not getting you know the. People are not excited about it from a drug company standpoint unless someone were to figure out that their statin was better. So we have talked to those that might have better statins. But we, we don't think, we're not going to go rely on the drug companies. We're actually sort of raising funds of our own and going to NEI, hopefully for health. And it, it won't, be, won't be a hugely expensive study. Uh, so I think we can probably get that done. You know, and it would be, you know, even if you could have a treatment that was just sort of for the fat, juicy Drusen people, <laughs> you know, that would be pretty exciting. Uh, and again, to maybe just push them back, you know, a decade or two would buy them a lot of time. Now, you know, it, it may be we're wrong and that these guys are going to end up with geographic atrophy. We just have had too small a group to see it, you know, and that's, that's what the risk. And, and you do have to watch. I mean, we've had people call up and want to be on the statin, so, that, you know, try not to get that going until we really know the answer, having been through, like, interferon and other things. But I, if people do it, you do want to have an internist involved and, and monitor liver function tests because you can get somebody into trouble. Sorry. In the back, maybe, first, please. Uh, are there environmental or geographic or vocational variations that give you any clues? Um, so there are, there are certainly different phenotypes in different realms, regions of the world. So that's you know what we were alluding to in terms of you know Asia shows up with polypoidal, uh, and some of the genetics have been different when people have looked at different populations. Um, you know, other, there are certainly lifestyle risk factors that increase your risk, and smoking's been the most consistent. And you know, smoking and Meg's done this work with smoking <coughs> with certain genetic risk factors goes you know really really increases your risk. Just related to the statins, do you think that once you kind of clear the drusen that you'd have to maintain that high dose, or do you think you could taper off or right. down? So I mean, we, you know, early to even know that, but we have generally pulled people off. We think that it probably takes decades for that to accumulate, and we're seemingly able to wash it out pretty quickly, uh, that you would not have to certainly stay on the high dose. Sometimes hard to get the patients to come off, <laughs> as you can kind of imagine they, they want to stay, but you can get them at least down to something that's not more reasonable. Related to that, um, the plasmapheresis was done for a while as a study, right, and, and didn't work in AMD. But people would show anecdotal cases um, where somebody had plasmapheresis during the lipids, and they did seem to respond, and they did have those big bruises. And I wonder if if you have any insight into has anyone ever divided out those, and could it be that? They just lumped everyone together, and if they had just a category of the juicy bruise, and that they could have been helped. And then the flip side is what happens when you step plasma freeze? Does it come back quickly? 
Yeah, so again, if you look, you know, the, the, the responders, non-responders of our group, the ones who did better didn't have as big a drop in their cholesterol. So, not, you know, the serum levels may not, you know, it may be a much more local phenomenon. But I don't know whether people have looked in the categories from the plasma resistance. It might be interesting. I'm not sure that I want to get that going again and sort of die yeah. a tiny oh. death. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, thank, thank you. you.